and because we're way out in Hurstbridge, so it's her website to see just how many she's actually won. Um, one of the very exciting things which we'll touch on is that the major motion picture adaption, um, adaptation of The Dry, starring none other than Eric Banner himself as Mr. Aaron Falk, is set for release in Australian cinemas uh, next year. Jane has already had a sneak peek and has got some news about where you might actually see Jane if you watch The Dry next year. Jane, it's such a pleasure to speak to you. Welcome. Oh, thanks, Kate. Thank you so much for, um, for doing this. It's always, it's always great to talk to you. Jane, I have to begin. You are in Melbourne, as I am. We are still in lockdown. And a question that only a Melbourneian with two children can ask another Melbourneian with two children, where have you put them and have you locked the door in the room you are in? Yeah, I, I, yes, I have. I have you. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> well, so I've got sort of boxes stacked in front of it. So it's an early warning system. So if, it, if the door starts to kind of creak open, I can quickly kind of shove, shove it shut from a distance. So perfect. Um, barricade it down. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Because, Jane, of course, at this time with one of your books out, you would normally be on flights, there would be hotels, there would be cabs, there would be TV studios. I want to ask you, has there been any advantages to this? What's one thing you've enjoyed about a lockdown launch and, and the one thing that you're really, really missing? Yeah, so, um, well, I'll go, so I'll go negative first and I can end on a positive. Right. Um, I guess, um, yeah, what, one thing that I do miss, I think, is, is going to see readers face to face because, I mean, as you would know, writing a book is so solitary and, you know, for, for the whole book, you kind of, you know, alone at your desk, you know, inside your own head. And I think one of the real, I, I sort of think like the rewards of that is getting to go out and like meet people when it's finished and sort of sort of seeing the readers and their whites of their eyes and the book in their hands. And yeah, you think actually it is, you know, it's all kind of real and it's, it's come to this moment. So I do, I do, I do miss that kind of face-to-face -face, um, interaction. But having said that, I do think as well, um, like the virtual events have been really great, you know, and I mean, I've tuned into quite a lot myself, um, you know, first to, to, to see how they run and, and, you know, and I think the amazing sort of like opportunity to kind of, um, you know, kind of get this beamed into your own house. Like there's, you know, not, it doesn't take a lot of um, effort, you know, you just have to yeah. kind of log in and, you know, I think it's sort of been a really great way to kind of, I guess um, for me to connect with authors that maybe I wouldn't have had a chance to see live and also sure. I suppose ideally you know talk to readers who who couldn't for various reasons come to live events so that's been really good. There's certainly parts of it that I hope do continue for all of us for the entire book community in into the future because that capacity to go to book launches in Brisbane and be here at Avid when we're here it's it's fantastic. Okay Jane let's get on to your book The Survivors your fourth novel it's another absolutely compelling uh, cracker of a book. I'm very lucky that I get sent books um, a bit early, but my husband watches the letterbox and watches as I bring them in. And when he saw that it was a Jane Harper, he leapt on it. He was like, no, nah, that's mine first. I was like, what? Hang on a second. This is a privilege that I get because I'm a writer and podcaster, but no, he ripped through it first, um, but obviously was not allowed to make any noises while he was reading next to me. So I wouldn't have any spoilers. Um, this time it's set in a small coastal town uh, in Tasmania. Kieran and his wife Mia and their new baby have returned to Evelyn Bay, the town they grew up in to help move Kieran's ailing father. Um, but pretty quickly there's a body and our characters are drawn into a mystery that grips the whole town. Now we are going to be very mindful of spoilers in this conversation. So when you get your chance to ask questions at the end, audience members, please be aware that not everyone has read to the end yet. Um, Jane, what was the first seed for this story? Yeah, you know, that's such an interesting question because um, I, I find like so often, you know, when I think back to, you know, people say, where did you get the idea from? Or, or, or what, you know, what kind of um, drew you to it? And, and I think like writing is such a kind of layered process that often like almost the, the, the initial idea gets superseded so many mm. times that it, it almost it almost doesn't connect in a way um I mean so if I had to kind of um pinpoint it I guess you know it would be that I had this idea for um this this you know this young guy returning to his his home community um 
you know, having kind of um, had sort of a, a traumatic event in his past and, and in, so, in some ways sort of overcome that and what the, the lingering effects of that would be. Um, and, you know, and wrapped around that was, you know, it, it's sort of a mystery that kind of draws him in and, and um, you know, invites him, I guess, to, to reflect on things he, he, you know, his past, I guess, and things that, you know, he, he thought to be true with, you know, the benefit of some maturity and a bit of hindsight. So um, I suppose, um, which I guess is the plot. So I suppose it does actually still relate to what happened in the end. But, it, you know, I think, you know, that's one thing that I've really discovered, you know, right, because I'm sure you have as well, that it, it just, it's so, um, you know, it, it's, it's such a kind of, um, process where you just build on things and you're constantly like refining and shaping it and um often like the end product is not necessarily you know quite what yeah that initial idea was really um you know and you, and you do sort of i think ideally give yourself space for those you know the good ideas to rise to the surface at what point does place come into it for you because sometimes in in my mind I've got this vision of Jane Harper in her writer's studio with like a map of Australia and all the different landscapes you know um rainforest you know outback and rural and then I'm like maybe she'll go to the mountains next or like deep tropical Cape York do you when does place come into it for you because it's so visceral in each of your books yeah like, you know, it, it actually it, it comes really early and um I'm I do think, I do actually think, go through a little bit of a, a kind of, yeah, geographical, mental, <laughs> yes. Australia. Um, but I think, um, you know, fortunately, I think, you know, for, for the ideas that I've sort of had so far, the, um, the setting is really, is quite a natural one for the idea I've had. So, you know, for this one, um, you know, the, the, it, I did really um, have this kind of vision just sort of coastal town. And then we think about your know, small coastal communities with really beautiful like seascapes and that kind of real rugged coastline. Um, Tasmania was a really obvious choice. You know, it was, it felt like a really, really natural place to set it. So um, that was, that was, you know, almost right, right from the start. I kind of knew that would be where I wanted to set this book. Um, you know, and, and, I think I'm looking when I'm looking for settings. I'm, I'm looking for something really that is um, is going to support the action. So, you know, I, I I wouldn't just pick a setting just because it was kind of interesting to itself. I think it has to really feel like it's it's um, it it kind of fits in with the, the plot idea and it's going to shape the characters in a way that's going to support that. You know, who they are. Like you know, people who grow up in small coastal towns are different from people who you know, have maybe have grown up in say outback Queensland, you know, there's a, there's a difference in who they are as adults because of their surroundings. Um, so that's something I'm really aware of as well. I, I know that you visit place as part of your research and I know that you went down to Tasmania. I'm really interested to know how you record um, your observations and the experience of being there. Like, is it before you write? you begin the writing of the book or is it in the middle of it? Are you taking pictures, taking notes? Can you tell us a little bit about that research process? Yeah, you know, it's, it's actually, cause I, I, I tuned into one of um, your talks, um, Kate, the other week um, for the mother folks, when I think you were saying about when you went on your um, yachts, <laughs> your, your yacht tri trip feels like the wrong word, um, you know, uh, research and, and how um, you talked to Charlotte Wood. And I think she said to really write down all those kind of, like the sensory things and yeah. and um i thought that was really interesting um and something i might in fact steal actually um because so, <laughs> um so i i tend to go um well i like to always go at the same kind of point in the writing process and that's when um so i've got i'll do a lot of planning first and i'll really kind of get the, the structure you know how it needs to be and um you know, and that will be like months and months and I'll, I'll kind of fill in any sort of urgent gaps with research from, you know, from, from my desk. So um, anything that is really going to be, um, you know, it, it's kind of really important for the plot at that point um, to the extent that I can. And then once I've got the kind of um, the plot, you know, firm and I've done like basically a full draft, that is when I like to go, um, on the on the ground research trip because at that point i like, like I, I know exactly what the story is and i know what's going to happen and i know the gaps in my knowledge as well so i can really kind of pinpoint exactly what is it's quite a it's, it's quite a sort of um uh 
efficient use of, of time at that point. So I, I know what I'm looking for. But at the same time, you always find things that you didn't you didn't know you were looking for, you know, conversations and things you didn't even know really existed. And so um, at, at that point in the writing process, so I've still got plenty of time to, you know, um, to turn it or, or, or change things or, um, you know, as I need to, depending on what I discover. So that's when I that's when I go. There's an amazing uh, scene, and this isn't a spoiler, but there's an, a, an amazing scene that involves uh, scuba diving. And I know that this was part of your experiential research. I also just recently learned that you had a, a 12 week old at the point that you were doing this. Yeah. So, and who you were traveling with. Yeah. You didn't did. actually do this research trip alone, Jane. No, no, I didn't. So I have, um, I have a, um, a little girl who's just, just turned four. So she was three at the time. And then I have a baby who was at the time, yet 12 weeks and I remember 12 weeks specifically because like because I knew um because Tasmania has so Tasmania has um lots of shipwrecks in its waters and it's one of the few places in Australia that you can kind of go and dive and see certain vessels and and so I really wanted to kind of include that in the book so I think that's just such a you know it, it's, it's it's such a kind of you know sort of beautiful kind of part of the state I guess um and something quite unique to that that part of Australia so I knew I wanted to include it but I I don't know how to dive you know and I I knew I didn't know nearly enough to, uh, yeah you can't you can't sort of fake a scene yeah. like that no you, you can't you, you so I was like okay so I guess I'll I guess I'll go diving <laughs> so I sort of booked in to go diving in a you know it's kind of to be fair it was February but the waters around Tasmania are still pretty cold oh. any time of year you know so, That's what uh, you get that from reading it. At the time, I was thinking, how are they, why are they doing this? This is crazy. Yeah, I know. But I mean, it, it, apparently, people love it, you know. It's, uh, it's so, so I, so I went, so I had this, um, had this, like, so like I said, I wanted to go on my research trip at a certain point in the writing process. Um, and I kind of, so I, you know, kind of booked it, you know, when I thought, you know, okay, like the baby's 12 weeks old. I really need to go now. If I leave it any later, it's going to kind of throw out the whole schedule. So we'll go. So I went down, like my husband came, the two kids came. Um, they didn't come diving, obviously. Um, they stayed at a caravan park and played in the playground or something. And I, and I had to go diving on my own. And it was, um, I, like, it was really, it was really great. And it was, to it was completely worth doing. You know, I learned so much, you know, this, like you said, that experience of kind of the, the, the feeling of it you know like the water and the breathing and were you terrified yeah I yeah I, I was a bit um I was a bit I can see why I think it's one of those things where you know some things you kind of you can see how people either like love it or hate it I think yeah. I'm not sure I totally hated it but it wasn't sort of something I thought you know wow this is the extreme sport for me you know and it wasn't just because I was having to you know you know, squeeze myself into a wetsuit 12 weeks after giving birth you know that wasn't, that wasn't the only reason horror it the only reason. <laughs> um but it, I think it was just um that feeling of um you know like I was having to concentrate really hard not to kind of resist you to like rip my mask off yes it's so it's so unnatural um and, and I guess that was something I wanted to capture but at the same time the characters in my books in, in this book do like diving you know something I was trying to yeah they are comfortable with it so mm. I was trying to sort of think at the same time like okay so this isn't really for me but it is for them so what is it about it that they you know what is it about it they they are enjoying and they're yeah. getting out of this and there were things I could see there were things that, that absolutely people would completely get out of it. It's also one of those incredible kind of high risk, amazing, it, it's an invitation in terms of your plot. And when you were saying before that you need the place to work in with the story that you've already constructed, it does that so beautifully. I have to ask, um, Kieran and Mia are, are newish parents and there's this beautiful sense um, through the book of that, the you know you're being constantly aware as a reader of where the baby is like either Kieran or me are looking after the baby you know leaving it on the beach to to quickly run down and put their feet in the water or um the sleep deprivation all of that um I knew that you'd had a baby last year how much of that could you just feed directly in there Jane yeah I mean a lot like I mean um you know, I sort of, um, you know, mentioned acknowledgements that my, my son kind of helps, you know, like inspire that character, the, the, the character of the baby quite a lot. Um, although I did, I had decided early on that he he was going to be, you know, this, this kind of new father figure. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I definitely had the kind of the, the hands-on research 
for that, which was good. I mean, you know, the, like the whole kind of having to, you know, strap the baby to your chest and, you know, every time you want to leave, leave the room, you know. Um, but um, I think, you know, when I'm thinking about the characters, you know, I do, I do think a lot about what their sort of support system is going to be. Yeah. Um, and I, I use the word support, like not actually totally in a positive sense as well, I guess like responsibility as well. And, mm. and you know, who, um, you know, who they can confide in or who they sort of have the, the kind of close, close bonds with, but maybe don't see eye to eye, that kind of thing. Because I think those are, it's through those relationships that you can really convey a lot of information to the reader um, in, in a very natural way without having to really labour the points Mm. with a lot of like internal internal thoughts or you know you do sorry I was going to say you do it so so beautifully well and I know that you also um did quite a bit of research for the character of Kieran in terms of his dealing with the past and guilt and that internal landscape for him as well can you tell us a little bit about that yeah, sure. So, um, you know, one of the sort of the, the, the sort of big themes that kind of emerged in the book was this kind of you know, sort of guilt and grief and the, the the you know ripple effect that can have in someone's life. Um, and I think um, you know, for me, the, the themes um, the themes were always character driven. Like I never really I never sort of set out to kind of write about a certain theme. It's always sort of comes from you know, thinking about the character and what their experiences would be and and how how they're living their life and interacting with people um and you know i think um when you sort of touch on themes i think people have many people have experienced you want to you know do it accurately and sensitively as much as possible if it's not something maybe you know you're, you're directly familiar with um up close so um so i spoke to um yes yeah, so i spoke to um, a clinical lead advisor from beyond blue about specifically kind of mental health issues around um guilt and grief and you know what kind of advice and particularly the young men as well you know what kind of advice they get how successful that is what kind of things do help what kind of things do they tend to do that don't help you know that kind of stuff so um, and that was really useful like that was that was a really really enlightening conversation so I was lucky to have that access and be able to um you know hopefully sort of weave that in in throughout the story I think that that any reader would say through all of your um, incredible four novels that that sense that um, you know the characters so well is partly what makes them such a rip-roaring success because it translates immediately through to the reader and we feel like we are very much part of, of both their internal world and the way that they're acting with all of the other people around them. There's, I, I would say in your last two books in particular, there's this kind of, thread or examination of masculinity, toxic masculinity, the way in which groups of men talk, don't talk, act, don't act. Has this been something that you've kind of really consciously been exploring or is it just the way that those characters have come up? You know, I think, um, you know, it's it's probably the way the characters develop. Um, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't sort of... Um, you know, it's not to say that I'm not sort of aware that, that that kind of, I guess, might come up because, you know, you, you sort of, when, when you, even at the early stage when you think about characters and, mm. you know, people of certain ages and, and you know, this, um, I think there's themes in all of our lives that, that are kind of constant and universal and recognisable. And I think it's inevitable that some of those will, will surface. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I mean, it really is like... Um, like it really is character driven i think because a long for a long time you know the way i sort of structured it, the planning of the novel um is you know i i sort of you know i think about the kind of the plot and the setting and what's going to happen and then i'm thinking about the characters that are going to help make that happen and for a long time they're really two-dimensional so they you know they they kind of often they're unnamed for quite a long time and they're literally like the main character the friend, the dad, you know, the, you know, the love. How is this? I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm so fascinated. Do you have this up on a wall? Is it, is it graphic or is it a spreadsheet or just notes? How are you recording that kind of part of the process? Um, so I just do it on like a word document really. Um, I, there's probably a better way to do it. I'm sure there's probably better programs oh. to do it, but I, I sort of never really, you know, when I'm kind of in that, I can't, I can't really be bothered. 
it's probably false economy, but I can't be really bothered spending time learning yeah. the programs, you know, if I'm not, to, you know, so I kind of go for the old fashioned way. So um, I do, so if I'm, if I'm making, if I've got an idea when I'm out and about, I make a note on my phone, literally on the notes app on the iPhone. And I have like a folder, you know, it'll say like book four or whatever. Um, and, and, then, and then every now and again, I'll sort of, um, you know, kind of put that into a, some sort of Word document so I don't lose it. And then, um, yeah, when I'm sort of planning, um, I'll have kind of a, probably a, just a Word document with like the, the, the plan for the plot. And then I'll, I will have a separate Word document where I'll have the characters and I'll, I'll sort of put in ideas about them. But um, I mean, it's pretty, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not sort of high tech at all. It's literally would have like main character and it would kind of have, you know, things I'm sort of thinking about him or her and um yeah and that that's that's how i do it it's, it's just yeah it's just just you do it it whatever that theory is jane it it works very bloody well um the relationship with uh kieran's parents was just um so beautiful to read it was really hard to read at times his his um father is unwell um and the the tension in that i thought that you just did so in incredibly well was there anything behind that uh that you really wanted to explore in terms of the father's illness or uh did the plot kind of drive that combination yeah i mean it's, it was probably a bit of both like in in terms of um so i'd say things are always kind of plot driven but then you can have things that are plot driven and there could be a number of different ways you can execute them so that's when you start to think so how you know so I, I I want my main character to come back to this small town. Um, what 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 could draw him back? You know, the age he is, and you know what would sort of draw him back for you know a, a reasonably sort of you know mediumly extended period, I guess, um, and have him um, you know really sort of I think reflect on things as well. So you, you you know you're looking for something that is going to you know, kind of create that opportunity, I guess, for the character to have that connection and reflection. Um, and I thought, um, you know, so I think about a few different things, but I think that that one, that relationship with, you know, his parents and his father who has sort of early onset dementia and um, is, is really not um, the man that he was and the, the father mm. that Kieran remembers. You know, it, it, it sort of, it, it really, I think, forces Kieran to kind of, um, you know, look, his, his father really only exists in his mind in a lot of ways because the man who's there is not there anymore. Um, you know, so that, that sort of, um, in, you know, in, invites a lot of introspection, I guess, around his relationship with his, with his parents. And, you know, and I think that, you know, a lot of people who, you know, have had, ever had sort of someone with that kind of illness, you know, who's close to them. I mean, you know, you sort of be familiar with that that sense of someone being gone well before they're gone, they're really gone, you know? Mm. So that was something I, you know, I wanted to kind of bring out as well. It was, it was really, really beautifully done. Um, I want to ask about now flip to a delicious kind of a character who I just enjoyed reading on the line so much. The, the uh, writer, the famous writer who is in town, George Barlin, who writes at the surf and turf and has, has bought property there. And he was just, uh, glorious and and I must admit to reading it going is Jane is Jane having an in joke with all of us with this with this character here I have to quote um, at one stage he says writer's block is for amateurs mate I do this for a living and I was like oh is this Jane just putting a comment into the book tell me where did he come from because he's the first author that you've written in I believe to your books yeah tell me about him <laughs> Yeah, so George, so George Barnes, so um, he was a really interesting character to write. And um, as I said, he, so he's a, he's a very successful author who's come to the town for, um, you know, really sort of a sea change, you know, inspiration. Um, and, you know, but I think, I think like, I, I hope like all the characters, it, it has a bit more to him than just his, you know, his, his profession really. Um, but I do really enjoy, you know, his, his profession and the opportunity oh. that kind of gives, you know, um, you to sort of, I suppose, um, I suppose like, you know, include a little bit of, you know, your own kind of experiences and, and conversations with other authors and things. So, um, so with, with George, I mean, he, um, you know, it was, well, actually, similar actually to, to the last, um, you know, what we were discussing with um, Kieran's dad, I think with characters, you're always, again, you're looking for, 
realistic ways to introduce people. So, you know, you need um, people in a small town, you want people who are insiders and outsiders, and he's very much an outsider. And he, um, you know, he has a, a very different job from other people in that town. And it is sort of, you know, so again, you're looking for something who, who could kind of fulfill, you know, a role where um, they have that sort of a different mindset and a different view of what's going on than other characters. And I thought that was a really perfect opportunity to, to, to have someone who sort of for, for a living observes and, you know, and he does, and he pays, pays such close attention, which is the, the joy of him as well. Do people know that Jane Harper is in town doing research? I have this idea. It's like Di Morrissey, you know, picking her spot in Australia and going off. And because you get that, I feel like you must walk up and down the streets kind of slightly eavesdropping and observing and doing that paying attention like Valen does himself in that town to get that extraordinary sense of each place that, that, that you get. Do you do it incognito? What, what do you do? Dark glasses? I'm, I'm, I'm going to quote George Barlin again and say, does anybody ever recognise all of this? The answer, the answer is no. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, like, I, like I fly well under the radar. I mean, not, not even sort of, I don't even have to make an effort to fly under, under the radar. It just, you know, it, like that's just, you know, how it is. Um, so, um, no, I mean, I think if it's, um, if it's someone um, like who I, who I kind of know I need to speak to specifically for the book and I know I'll probably be using their information in the book and, you know, um, I will, I will sort of say like, I'm writing a book and, and the answer is always like, oh, how lovely. That's nice. Well, I'd be happy to help, you know? And, and so it's sort of, you know, they're, they're like they've never heard of me or anything. I read the books, you know? And so, um, you know, and then, and now then a lot of the more, the sort of interesting things often come from just casual conversations when you just, you know, I don't know, like in the cafe or something or talking to the, the, the person at the, you know, behind reception somewhere. Um, and you, you know, and you kind of just saying, oh, how's, you know, how, how's the season going? Or, you know, what, what do you do when you're not here or whatever? And, um, and you learn all, all kinds of like really just day to day, your useful things, I think. Mm. Um, which is exactly the kind of stuff, you know, that's, that's great to be able to bring in. Yeah, and, and which is what you use to, to build place and those characters so well. In, in one of your interviews, I think it was with, um, it was one of the ones on Facebook Live with Mamma Mia, I think, you said you didn't want your stories to be a, a trick, that, that you start with wanting the characters to feel real and that there is real character development and motivations and themes. Do you ever feel tricked by a book that you're reading? And, and what is it that writers do particularly in crime and mystery that that do make the trick of the crime instead of giving yourself a fully fleshed kind of a book yeah I feel tricked all the time like often I would say um disappointingly often possibly like just I mean and I'm talking about over the years as well I'm not talking about kind of recent releases or anything just I think you know if you read sort of crime mystery novels like I think you know you know you know that feeling of kind of getting to the end and just thinking like, wait, what? You know, and it's yeah. sort of, it's, it's that, it's that which I really um, always want to avoid where, or, or where you, you sort of telling, you know, my mum and I sort of discuss books quite a lot and, and she, she doesn't really mind spoilers and things. And she'll, she'll say, you know, what happened in the end? I'm like, do you know, honestly, I'm, I, I can't even, I'm not even quite sure. Like I'm not, I'm not yeah. sure, you know, it's, it's cause it, and it's that sort of feeling I think when um, you, I think you can sense it often in a book. You can sense that the writer has kind of written themselves into a corner and they've created this great kind of hook and opening um, and premise that feels impossible to solve. And surprise, surprise, it is impossible to solve, you know, and, and, and they end up having to kind of, I, I don't know, just solve Pull a rabbit out of a hat. Yeah. So, um, so that's always what I'm trying to avoid. And I think, you know, I, I sort of talk about this some, um, Quite a bit when you know people ask about how I structure the books, but when I'm thinking about ideas, um, it's taken me a while to realise this is what I do, but this is what I do, and that is I sort of, I start from the end. So when I'm thinking about the what you know, when you ask me like, what what am I what am I going to do for the next book, what I'm thinking about is like what is going to be essentially I guess the who done it or the mystery or the reveal, and and then what is it. Um, what has happened to these characters to put them in a position where this extreme event has happened? And what's their, what have their lives been like up to that point? Is it something recent? Is it something that's been long building? 
is it a moment of madness is it something that's been planned you know it's all those kind of things like what would like what would drive you Kate to actually commit violence against someone else say Mm. really in your life and I bet it's not I mean, I know oh. it, might, it might feel During like... During lockdown. Woo! <laughs> so I know, there's a, there's a laundry <laughs> list right now, but in normal times, yeah. um, there's probably only, you know, <laughs> like few, fewer things. So Few, yeah, so that, that's sort we'll of We'll talk I'm, about this later, Jane. <laughs> exactly. Um, so that's kind of what I'm, you know, and I think, you know, by, by kind of starting the end point, it, by building the book around that, at least I know, I know where I'm going and I, and, and, I, and I know that the resolution will make sense because everything else has been built on that how many times and i i know i wanted to ask you about that writing from the end because you and um the amazing karina kilmore featured on uh one our series for the podcast this year and that is the feedback that we get is what i loved most was jane harper talking about writing from the end first so it it fascinates writers in in the terms of how you do that do you do you get to points? I know that I think Anne Lamott talks about a, a crack, you know, a hairline fracture in her manuscript where you think oh, I've broken it. Like, how often do you come up against um, blocks, hurdles, parts where you have to work back again and, and go in a different direction, or have you really got the process down now? Yeah. So I um, with each book, I've I, I reckon it's the process has got a lot more streamlined because you do yeah. sort of learn from you know from your past efforts really and what works so so um so for me and this isn't true for everybody I, I would has I would sort of um you know say you know if if you know not every writer's process is the same so don't try and shoot on yourself into someone else's process if that's not working for you but for me planning is the way is the best way for me to do it um and so so what normally happens is, um, so I will I will plan like for months and months. I will I will probably yeah, spend like more time planning than I do actually writing you know the book. So um, and I'll um, and I think sometimes as well people feel like planning kind of strips the creativity out of it. But I, I honestly find completely the opposite because I think if you by planning, you um, it allows me to. Um, try things out without having to commit to them. So mm-hmm. I can I can try ten different ten different you know ways to do something um and do you know a few hundred words rather than pick one way and do several thousand words and then have to delete it and you know you lose the energy and you only have so much time and mental capacity and things so um so for me um you know i will i will like i will plan all the way down to things like the start and end of chapters like the cliffhanger moments what the next chapter is going to you know, be that that sort of transition. Um, I will know every I will know every single chapter in order before I start to write it. And I, and some of those chapter notes will be a thousand words long. So I'm almost just kind of filling in the gaps by that point. Mm. You know, I'm just kind of fleshing it out really. Um, the thing is, though, that often what happens is I'll, I'll do a full draft, you know, and and I'll kind of hand it in for a structural edit, and then with the you know once it's it's weird like once that's done it's amazing then how your mind suddenly like clears up and you you find it happened with the lost man it happened with this one i just find like another thread and you're like you know geez how did i not see that how did i not see that that will will literally lift this another you know i don't know 50 percent again you know so and then you sort of think Great. Well, now I've thought of it. I can't unthink it. So I'm, gonna, so I'm gonna have to do it. So then it comes. So it comes back to you. And then I often will actually kind of almost rewrite the whole book. I'll plan again though. I'll go through and I'll plan again. And 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 you think to yourself, it's okay. I can reuse loads of this. Like I'm just weaving in this new idea. I can reuse loads of this. And then you get to it, and it's this kind of um, new suit, old shoes type thing. You know, and actually, like, sure, you could kind of reuse some of it, but actually the ideas have moved on and um, yes, it's been superseded. And I'm sorry, I think one of my children is. <laughs> it's the system. The the box system is going to fall <laughs> down. It's good. I think she's, I think she's just gone. Um, <laughs> and um, where was I wearing this? Uh, yes. Yeah, so it, it um, what was I talking about? The, the way that the, you keep on putting new words in so that when you're doing this new draft and weaving it in. Yeah. So I will rewrite, I will rewrite almost, you know, often I'll end up rewriting the whole, the whole thing, but it's, it's easier second time. And you, and you mm. feel like the ideas are there to be, 
exploited um, and it's worth doing and things. But I think the thing is, that, the thing I would say about why, again, why planning helps me is that I feel like um, it, it gets me to that. I haven't, I haven't used up all my energy on, on draft, just trying out ideas. So yeah. I'll plan, I'll do a draft, I'll have a better idea and then I'll do another draft. And I've still only maybe written it twice rather than, you know, I don't know, 20 times. Yep. Um, so you save your energy, you know. I loved, you've got a very popular um, TEDx talk um, on creativity and on your process. Um, part of it is you talking about the kind of disciplined approach and part of what you got from journalism in being able to sit down and do that that kind of work. What does your day look like on a writing day, not a lockdown day when you're looking after children? <laughs> what on does your writing, writing day, day look like? Yeah, so, um, so I would... Um, so what I do is I, I, I do, I sort of treat it like a full-time job to the extent, you know, when I can. So um, I'll either have, so I have kind of either paid for childcare um, or my husband will, you know, take them those days. Um, we'll have them those days. Like he, he, he sort of is, is essentially a full-time um, childcare, you know, person, you know, when, when I'm sort of in the writing process. And, um, and so I would like leave the house. I go to, I have a little, an office space about 10 minutes walk so it's completely separate I go in there um and I find that really useful because I do find as soon as I go in there I don't use that space for anything else really and so in that that's actually really good I think that's a really good advice if, if you have the ability and capacity to have someone like that to just use that for writing because it means as soon as I'm in there my brain kind of knows this is what we're here for you know so um so I'll, I'll go in there and I'll, you know, I'll try and be there sort of, you know, for, for nine-ish or something, close to kind of normal work start time. And then I'll just, yeah, and I'll kind of just work right through till, you know, I don't know, four or five or something, whenever, you know, it's kind of, I need to um, come home and, you know, um, be with the family really. And um, and I'll, I'll sort of have, you know, I'll, I'll probably have like a plan for the day. Like I'll kind of know you know, it's, it's not sort of like a deadline for myself as such, but I'll kind of know what I would like to achieve that day. And, and it'll be like a manageable chunk. Like I won't sort of set myself unrealistic goals. It'll be sort of um, probably like a scene, you know, maybe not even like a whole chapter, but like, like I'm going to tackle like this bit and then tomorrow I'll tackle this bit. And um, yeah. And then I, and I kind of feel as long as I've done that, as long as I do that, then I know that, um, I'm on track and, you know, I'm on, on schedule and things. So that, that's what I'll do. It seems like such a very smart way to do it. Jane, I want to ask you, I, I will go to questions and we are getting to that time very soon. Um, but the dry, the, the movie of the dry is out next year. Can you please share with our audience about who they might see in the funeral scene, please? Well, if you look closely, if you keep your eyes wide open um, and don't blink at all, you might <laughs> see myself. <laughs> How did this happen? Well, it, it basically, um, so they were filming it last year, 2019, in Northwest Victoria. And um, they, and when I tell you they were filming it in the middle of nowhere, like I really mean it, like the, when, when they actually sort of um, in, invited me to go up and, like, and see what was going on, the, the, it was one of those things where the, the directions were essentially like a GPS coordinates, you know, like you, <laughs> you, you, it was like you drive, drive along this road for 40 minutes and then, you know, at the, at, at the broken fence, turn left. And, you know, if you, if you, if you hit the sort of the dead cow, you've gone too far, that kind of thing. So, um, so anyway, so they were, they were filming this funeral and wake scenes in this church, which was just like a church surrounded by fields. And, um, and I think actually we sort of, they wanted, they were, they really, you know, really kind of sort of wanted to invite me up anyway to see. And I think also it was a good opportunity to get a few more um, bums on seats in the church. Because <laughs> they love they this. Get people in really to, to fill this, fill this you know, tiny church. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I got to go up with like, um, at first it was going to be like me and my husband, I think. And then when I sort of realized they needed a few more people, I ended up completely sort of abusing the invitation about, you know, I don't know, a dozen sort of, yeah, assorted family and friends ended up um, going up there. But so, yeah, so we sort of sat there, funeral and wake, you know, sort of looked at the, the, the photo montage, you know, ha had the order of service, held a plate of lamingtons for eight hours in the, in the wake in the village hall. And um, it just seems yeah. the most surreal experience. You literally stepped into your, to your yeah. own novel. Do you think they've done it 
justice, Jane. Yeah, do you know, I honestly, I do. And I'm so relieved to say that because, I mean, what are the odds, quite frankly? Like, we've all seen adaptations, you know, of books, of book, I mean, not even books you've written, like, I mean, God, like, yeah, I mean, books you books, love, but books you just loved, you know, and seeing the adaptation, it's like, oh, you know, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's never, like, you know, it, it's so, it was actually not never, it's so rarely, I think, it lives up to, you know, what you want. And so then if it's actually like an adaptation of your own book, like the, <laughs> that, that feeling is like heightened, you know, a thousand times. Um, but honestly, they absolutely nailed it. I am like, I'm so thrilled. I, I was sitting in the cinema thinking like, you know, this is a, this is a separate creative project. You know, you've got to allow <laughs> people to, to do what they want to do to get the best possible. And honestly, by the end, I was like, you know, popcorn in mouth. Like, <laughs> <"What's> it? <laughs> That's yeah, great. It was, it was so good. I think they really, um, look, they did all the things, everything I could have asked for. So it's really, it's a really sort of faithful, thoughtful, you know, adaptation of the book the characters I think really really recognize was the characters in the um you know in the story um Eric Banner does as an amazing a job as you would expect scenery is beautiful and it and it's also just a really good watch you know it's not um it's not kind of too slavish it's not just kind of a, a sort of a, a, a plodding kind of slavish scene by scene retelling it's really got that kind of pace and kind of gripping thrillerness so like definitely when it you know we're all free again get your friends together very excited and it's thrilling you can't help but read the survivors and just be thinking like this is begging to be on the big screen the the ocean the storminess that small town kind of tension that you can just feel i can feel it now going up my back is there news about the survivors for us yeah, so so it's actually um, been optioned for a TV series. Amazing. Um, yeah, which is really good. So there's some more details to come for that in due course. Um, but that's it's still it's just really sort of happened. So um, so it's, I'm sorry, it's a little bit light on detail, but it's really I'm really excited that it's a really really great opportunity. I think for the book, um, I think it's in really really good hands, and um, you know, and I think um, you know, like I never sort of um, I never sort of feel like I'm going to have the luxury to kind of, you know, see a book adapted or have any say in, you know, what kind of form that would be particularly. But I mean, if I'd, if I'd had to sort of choose, I, I really feel like when I, this book would really lend itself to a TV series, it's, it's sort of the, the episodic kind of yeah. nature of it. And um, I think the um, the kind of twists and turns, you know, it would be great to have that kind of space for oh, that to play out. Very so, bingeable. So. I'm calling yeah. it right now, completely bingeable. Um, I know that I have to leave time for other people to ask questions. Chrissy, you know I've got a thousand more, but I'm going to hand over to Chrissy so that our wonderful audience can ask you some questions too, Jane. And they seem to have a thousand more as well. So ah. thank you, Kate. <laughs> That's been really great listening to you and it's sparked a lot of questions here. So here goes. Um, Elizabeth has asked, when you start writing, do you focus or start with the plot storyline or characters? So always the plots. Um, and then, um, yeah, always the plots and the setting. Then the... Um, then the characters and you know as I mentioned I think for a long time they're very two-dimensional like they're really are just sort of fulfilling a role and I'm kind of thinking who and I want them all to pull their weights as well I think it's really important that they all serve a purpose so I don't um I don't I think you know it's fair to say I, I, I don't sort of have super, superfluous characters who are just kind of there to make up the numbers they all ideally helping drive the story forward and then over time I'll kind of flesh them out and it's really then in that sort of fleshing out and thinking about their their backstories and who really they are that's when I think the themes start to emerge so that's kind of the order it comes in. Great and Danny has asked um, what types of books do you read and do you have some favourite authors? Do you know, I'm so thank you, Jane, for asking this question because I was saying earlier, and, and Kate, being as modest as she is, was saying, no, no, don't say. But I have to say, I've just finished reading Kate's amazing book, The Mother Fault, which if you haven't read it, um, you, you have to read this book. I was honestly blown away by this. And, and you know, it is such an incredible achievement. I absolutely love it, Kate. Congratulations. And, I, and I'm, I'm honestly not just saying this. You're making me blush. Yeah, I know that, that would be the polite. I, I realise it seems like this, this might just be me being polite because you're here. Um, but my God, like what an incredible book. I was on the edge of my seat. And the, the talk about like 
the way you've kind of captured the relationships between characters it was like so crystal clear it's like I know I've seen this I've seen this play out you know in real life um beautiful job so so yes yeah, so the mother fault by Kate Liverpool I can 100% recommend um I, you know honestly I think that's my that, you know well, I think I might leave it there I think just, <laughs> just that book it's excellent <laughs> um, and I agree it is an excellent book so um Thank well you. well done to recommend and avid reader have a bunch of them as well um so we've also got a question from Catherine who said did you do a lot of research about Alzheimer's Oh yeah, so I did. I did do. Yeah, I did do a fair bit about that. Um, although actually, my grandmother had um, had dementia in her later years, so a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the sort of, I guess, the, the way it manifests in the book is more is a lot of that kind of personal stuff that I think you notice when you have someone who has um, deteriorated, and um, and so a lot of that was, I guess, sort of drawn on my own kind of personal experiences of, of sadly watching her. Um, you know, stop being the woman she once was. Mm. Now, um, Jill has asked um, about character development. Do you use a combination of attributes from people you know to develop these characters? Is that something that you do? Uh, yeah, look, I think I think you do. I think inevitably you do. I mean, I wouldn't, I, I never would sort of set out to think, you know, I'm going to, um, you know, this character is going to be this person. Um, you know, because A, I think that would be, um, the person would probably recognise themselves, you know, and secondly, it's not very fair. And, and also, I think, um, really, you know, the, the, the characters are so, you know, you need them to be certain people and do certain things for the plot to work. So often, that is really what helps shape the characters um, a lot of the time. But I think having said that, you know, in, in building sort of authentic characters, I think inevitably you were drawn to, um, you know, things that you recognise, I suppose, and, and ideally hope other people will recognise too. So there's kind of, um, I don't know, little quirks or conversations and things that hopefully people will read and say, you know, yeah, like I've, you know, I, 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 I understand that. Right. So look, um, Heather has asked, over the last few years, there have been so many female Australian writers doing really well here and overseas, Hannah Kent, Candace Fox, Tony Jordan, Leanne Moriarty, and why do you think this is happening now as one of these writers? Oh, look, I mean, I guess, you know, my, you know, I suppose my question would be why, why hasn't it happened before, I suppose, really, or, um, and also when you say those names as well, I mean, I think, you know, it's, um, I mean, some of those authors have been working for quite a, quite a, you know, enjoy, enjoy success for quite a few years now. And maybe, maybe it feels like there's a sort of enough of a critical mass now that, you know, it feels like there's a lot of us doing it. But I think a lot of those people have been having, enjoying, you know, you know, yeah, great success for um, some time. I mean, I think, um, look, I think good stories will always be in demand. Well-written books will always find a home. Um, and I, you know, long may it continue, I think. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so Elizabeth has asked, um, you did the Curtis Brown creative writing course and how influential was that on learning about learning your craft and any advice for aspiring writers? Yeah, I mean, so I think, you know, my, um, you know, one of my biggest sort of, um, I, know, I guess, points of advice would be to make things as easy as you can for yourself if you're trying to write a book. And for me, you know, um, the reason I sort of was drawn to um, do a course was because I knew that as a journalist, I was really so sort of conditioned to, to work to deadlines and to kind of produce, you know, um, I guess on demand, you know, and I knew that was, a, that was sort of, um, I knew I could write under those circumstances, whereas I wasn't really sure if I could write just if I could motivate myself on my own when there was no real expectation. So that was sort of part of that. Cause I, I you know, you had kind of this, this sort of course, yeah, expectation you would, you would kind of contribute and, and, you know, be able to sort of um, be working on your book throughout. So that was, that was, that was really helpful for me um, in that. And I did look, pick up a lot of like really great writing tips along the way, but I think, you know, um, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of great writing advice out there. Um, if, you know, if you're looking for it, um, so, so if you feel like that is something that, um, you know, if you feel like that, that is kind of a, a good way you respond as well to having a bit of external pressure, that's a really good way to go. Um, some people maybe, you know, might benefit from like writers retreats or, you know, just writing sort of clubs and things. 
um, or nothing at all. But I think, um, so I do have a few, I mean, like my real kind of, a lot of my, my best advice is probably in that TEDx talk I did, which is available online. And, and so I guess good. I think it sums up a lot of my, um, right. you know, my, my thoughts around it. But I think, I think just try and make things easier on yourself. So try and, find, you know, if you can, like find a bit of consistent time to write, um, you know, write down your ideas. Don't, don't try and remember them all. You know, I mean, you know, we can't keep that many things in our head. Um, try and if you can sort of, um, you know, make, um, give yourself, I guess, it's the space and the, the mental headspace you need to think about your book. Like, it's, it's okay to kind of have to work on it. You don't have to pretend that it's going to come easily. It's, it's all right to sort of, you know, feel like it's a bit of a struggle and it is something that you're having to work at. Um, if it's not like a big bolt of lightning, that's, yeah. it's, it's not going to be a big bolt of lightning. It's going to have to be something you work on and it's absolutely fine to need to work on it. So I guess, so, but yeah, maybe check out a TEDx talk. That, that sort of probably sums it up a bit more succinctly. Cool. There's a lot of questions about um, the film process. I'll just sort of wrap them up in this one from Jill, which um, asks whether you were consulted at all on the script of The Dry. Um, so I did see it at some at various stages. Um, the script was actually written by Robert Connolly, who also directed the movie, um, and and has done a really you know really great job. So I, I met him you know a few times at various points throughout the process, and because he he actually lives quite near me, so we sort of just, would just go for a coffee or something, and um, he'd kind of fill me in on things. So um, but that was I guess that was more of a courtesy really than anything. I don't think they legally really had to consult me at all. Um, but um, so, and I, I think that's sort of a, something that, you know, like I, I think you have to be happy to, to, to hand things over when you, when you sell your work, you know, you, you don't own it anymore and you have to make your peace with that. Um, it does help a lot, I think, if the person who has bought it is someone you have faith in and you think, you know, really wants to sort of celebrate it and do it justice. So that, that goes a long way to, to building that trust, I think. Right. Um, so Joanna has um, asked about the balance of creating a setting which is based on a real place against making it obvious that it's it's that town. How do you kind of get that balance right? Yeah, it's a good, good question because, I mean, I always, so I always fictionalise the, um, you know, the, the main sort of setting in the town, but at the same time, oh, sorry, the setting in the book, but at the same time, I think um, ideally I want it to be recognisable as you know, a, a region. Um, and um, so what I, you know, the things I guess you try and you sort of cherry pick things that I suppose are quite specific to that region. Um, and it, it is, um, you know, ideally, like, if you can, like, pick from, I guess, different things. So it, it is very clearly a fictionalised place rather than any one specific town. But you're looking for things that I guess, you know, when you go to go on holiday or go visit somewhere yourself that you the things you sort of remember when you, you come back. So, you know, what, um, I don't know, like what, you know, what kind of, not just things like what do the houses look like and what's the weather like and, but things like, you know, what do they, I don't know, what are they serving in, in the cafe and what, you know, where are people buying their food from and, you know, how far do their kids have to go to, to go to school and, you know, things like little things like that and things like what, you know, what sort of, what kind of events would they hold in their village hall, you know? So things like that can kind of um, really help um, tap into those features that are kind of recognisable about a certain place without specifically identifying it as one specific place, I think. Right. And um, we do have a lot more questions, but I'll just end with this one, which several people have asked. Will Aaron Falk make an appearance again in a future book? Yeah, look, he will. I think um, absolutely. You know, I, I, like I really love writing about him. And the only um, you know, reason he hasn't really appeared in the last two is because I think, you know, it's really important to have those best characters for the book. And it, it, just knowing kind of the, the plot and things was really obvious to me very early on. These were you know, the lost man and the survivors needed to be standalones because this wasn't sort of a, a place for him. Um, but I think absolutely when I find, you know, the right kind of story for him, um, I think certainly for one more, you know, I feel, I feel it's more kind of, you know, a little bit more for his personal journey. And I actually, um, just in the last, it's funny, like, you know, as soon as the book comes out, your mind sort of does free up a little bit. And I've actually had like a, quite um, an idea I think would, could work really well for him just in the last sort of week, really, that um, it's sort of, 
I can sort of feel like it's, it's the kind of idea I've been looking for. It kind of ticks boxes. It, it's almost like a real kind of emotional feeling when you, you have an idea that you think, you know, yeah, actually I could, I could see that it's, it's a really, it's only the sort of skeleton idea, but I could see myself building that up. So, um, yeah, so watch your space. People will be very happy, happy to hear that. <laughs> it's been absolutely fascinating listening to the two of you. Um, give us a masterclass in how to, um, in how to write. Um, it's, Kate, you do a fantastic um, in conversation. So thank you for that. And Jane, um, thank you for this book. Um, as someone has said on the comments section, um, we do need books like this when we're um, in the middle of a pandemic, books that sweep us away and take us away from um, the, the troubles and the trials of our daily news cycle so thank you very much for for bringing this book to us um, and to end our event I'm actually going to allow everybody to unmute themselves so that we can have a final clap so um, this is the time where we get some interaction so um, just before I do because it will become chaos and then I will just end <laughs> the meeting without being able to come back to you thank you both for um, for being with us tonight and thank you thank you so much thank you Kate you know and, and thank you to every reader for for hosting this it's, it's really you know i really appreciate going to the effort of hosting an event like this virtually and giving us the opportunity to, to speak so and thank you everybody who's tuned in it's, it's really lovely to see you all and um you know and um yeah and i hope you enjoyed the book and and um thanks for spending some time with us tonight everyone please put your hands together for the wonderful jane harper here you can unmute yourself <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. It's okay. See you later. Bye. Thank you, Jane. Thanks, Bye. Chrissy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.